Hello, welcome to the debate. I'm Kavit Ahwaib. There is no compromise on Brexit that uh, commands majority public support in Britain with opposition to Prime Minister Theresa May's deal. The only point of the agreement. That is what Theresa May, of course, and uh, her supporters with the general public would agree to when it comes to the Brexit. But that may be a far cry from other parliamentarians and, of course, uh, others in the UK. In this debate, we're going to discuss the Prime Minister of the UK's um, reassurance of the deal that she struck with the European U Union after it was, well, uh, rejected by the MPs. Russia Mohamed Saleh is a correspondent who joins us now to tell us about the latest. Uh, we're looking at uh, Russian, from what I believe, the Tory hardliners, for a moment, what I'm reading in the headline, for the uh, deal uh, perhaps to be reconsidered. Is that accurate? And uh, what are we looking at in terms of the latest on this? Well, I think what we're seeing is Parliament perhaps trying to take control away from Theresa May in terms of offering something that could get through Parliament in terms of a vote uh, when it comes to a withdrawal agreement from the European Union. So we see Jeremy Corbyn moving in the direction of a second referendum, although he hasn't uh, come out and called for that yet explicitly, despite being under a lot of pressure from his own Labour Party MPs and members to do exactly that. He's also positing this idea of a withdrawal agreement which keeps the UK within the customs union and the single market. That is something that probably might get through Parliament, but obviously uh, the Tory party would not countenance that. Then we have Theresa May. Obviously, uh, we thought she was going to come out with a plan B yesterday after her plan A was rejected so uh, overwhelmingly last week. But uh, she seems to be continuing with her plan A, uh, and she is only focusing on really kind of getting some reassurances, not a renegotiation, but reassurances over the Irish backstop to prevent a hard border uh, in the north, between the north and the south of Ireland. Um, and at the same time, we have these cross-party talks, which were much mooted last week um, by Theresa May. She would consult, be more inclusive and consult opposition parties. But now uh, Jeremy Corbyn has accused her of that of being a PR sham. And actually what she's trying to do is solidify her Tory base by giving them assurances over the Irish backstop. So we're in an unprecedented situation, very uncertain situation. And we'll be back for a vote next week in Parliament on Theresa May's so-called Plan B. Thank you very much for that. Rosh Hashanah Masala, correspondent there from London. Our guest joining us for this debate. Paolo Rafone, Secretary General of the SIPI Foundation, joins us from Brussels. And we have Marcus Papadopoulos, publisher and editor at Politics First, joining us from London. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Paolo Rafone, uh, let's talk about what this plan B is. Our uh, correspondent uh, pointed out to that. Uh, Mark Drakeford, the Welsh First Minister, this is what he has said. He's dismissed Theresa May's Brexit Plan B as just a Plan A with a new helping of pious hopes. Do you see it that way? Uh, yes, in fact, she didn't uh, uh, propose anything new in the parliament, so she may be maneuvering behind the scenes and trying to uh, devise some kind of solution that can aggregate uh, the largest number of uh, per, uh, members of parliament to a possible positive vote. But for the time being, we do not have any detail on what she's proposing. So she's standing with her plan A without much of a change. Uh, uh, but it is true what the correspondent was saying. I mean, and, uh, the, the, the MPs, especially the backbenchers, are, uh, are very uh, noisy in uh, proposing amendments to the governmental plans to a point that it looks like uh, that the parliament is trying to um, uh, take the Brexit process out of the hands of government. Um, uh, this uh, this would be, from a democratic point of view, a positive step forward. But on the other hand, this would create uh, a, a divide in the country because anyway, people voted, they wanted Brexit, and this government has not been able to deliver a proper Brexit. So the situation is really embarrassing uh, to the point that some speculations are there that the, uh, Theresa May m might call upon the Queen to intervene into this uh, matter, uh, uh, basically uh, seeking to suspend temporarily the Parliament in order to avoid the 29th of January decision. Marcus Papadopoulos, do you believe that this uh, current administration, and in particular Th Theresa May, that no matter what she's going to do, uh, and we've seen what she has done so far, um, is not going to 
bring together either parliamentarians within or people who are divided on this. And her, as a figure, perhaps needs to be removed, or if were she to be removed, that someone else coming into play could sell this. Because uh, it seems like whatever she's trying to do doesn't seem to unite people to, around her cause. Mm. Well, it's nearly one week on since Theresa May's historic defeat in the House of Commons, and she has not offered in the last week any incentive to those 118 Conservative MPs and 10 Democratic Unionist MPs a reason for them to vote for the withdrawal bill when it next comes before the House of Commons. And I think that Theresa May must be feeling very, very frustrated because on the one hand, she's very close to delivering uh, Brexit on the basis of her withdrawal bill. But on the other hand, she's so far away. As a member of the Parliamentary Press Gallery, a number of um, Conservative Brexiteer MPs have told me that if the Prime Minister achieves a concession on the backstop in Northern Ireland, for example, a five-year limit to the backstop, then they will vote in favour of the Prime Minister's withdrawal bill. So that's why I say Theresa May is so close, but at the same time so far away. She's far away because the European Union has said there is going to be no concessions on the backstop, though perhaps there is just a, a little bit of hope for the Prime Minister because Poland Poland said in the last few days that there should be some sort of flexibility on behalf of the European Union when it comes to the backstop. And indeed, um, the, Poland said there should be a five-year limit. Now, Brussels has said that um, there will be no concessions, but maybe when push comes to shove, the European Union is going to have to show more flexibility. However, there is another possibility that has emerged in the last few days and that is Theresa May um, amending the Good Friday Agreement in order to resolve the backstop issue. But my word, amending the Good Friday Agreement runs very, very serious risks. And I mean serious risks, metaphorically speaking and literally speaking. So as it currently stands, there is no chance of Theresa May's withdrawal bill um, being passed by the House of Commons when it next goes before it. But of course, anything could happen in the next week or so. Exactly. Uh, I, I hate to uh, uh, mm, bring in a poll into the picture, Paolo Raffone, but then again, this is Brexit, so we're, uh, we're looking at extremes here. But this ICM poll it says that leaving with no deal seems to be the most popular option right now when put up against another referendum or a general election. Uh, but at the same time, it only commands 28% support. Mind you, news has come out that uh, Prime Minister Theresa May's spokesman has said that Cabinet has received weekly updates on a no-deal Brexit planning. Uh, what scenario do you think suits the situation that the UK is facing? As I was saying before, I mean, this is an extremely embarrassing situation because Theresa May committed herself to uh, uh, produce a Brexit on the basis of the popular will expressed in the referendum. And she did try to make some kind of a deal with the U European Union, a deal which has been uh, dubbed uh, correctly, I believe, as uh, the worst of all options, because in fact it's a, a deal that doesn't satisfy the the uh, leave or the stay people, so or the remain people. So the the situation is is really incredible. I mean, she put herself in a, in a, in a, in a corner, and now now she is trying to blame the parliament not being capable to support her. But the parliament is um, trying to amend her uh, proposal. So th these amendments may go in the direction of having no Brexit at all, which would be exactly what she didn't want. So 
the, the, the situation is so uh, slippery and so embarrassing that she may be forced to, to take extreme actions like to to call the Queen into the issue to suspend the Parliament and avoid the 29th of January vote, or to decide herself to resign and go to elections, or then to concede to the Labour proposal, um, the Labour Party proposal of a second referendum, which is not uniting also all the Labour Party. Uh, so it, it, it's a very confused situation at the moment, it's unpredictable. Yes, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the opposition Labour leader. Go ahead, Marcus Papadopoulos. You had a reaction. Go ahead. Well, I want to say this. Whatever your views are on Britain's membership of the European Union, you have to recognise that this is an unbelievably complicated situation. And whatever your views are on Theresa May, you have to give her credit in that she has shown great tenacity, great determination. And she is the only politician at the House of Commons or in the House of Commons who has put forward an option. As Theresa May said last week in the Commons after her defeat, the House has rejected the deal, but the House has not said what it wants. So if we take the Brexiteers within Mrs May's Conservative Party, they have said to her what they don't want, but they have not told her what they do want. If we turn to the Labour Party, well, the Labour Party, uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party, the party at Westminster, is very divided over Europe. Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, throughout his parliamentary career was against Britain's membership of the European Union, favours a soft Brexit that would involve Britain remaining in the European Union. However, a number of members of his shadow cabinet do not agree with Jeremy Corbyn's vision of Brexit. And a lot of his backbenchers do not agree with his vision of Brexit. And to make things even worse for Mr Corbyn, many of his Labour MPs want to see Britain remain in the European Union. So you can't reconcile the House. And at the same time, the House is not putting forward an alternative to Theresa May's, um, to Theresa May's withdrawal bill. Now, in regard to um, Jeremy Corbyn endorsing a second referendum, well, I have heard nothing like that at Parliament. Indeed, it would be electoral suicide for Mr Corbyn to support a second referendum on Britain's membership of the EU. Why? Because he would risk losing many, many votes in the north of England. Traditional Labour voters who only came back to Jeremy Corbyn at the, at the 2017 election because they liked Mr Corbyn. However, those same voters voted um, emphatically for Britain to leave the European Union. So if Mr Corbyn supports a second referendum, those traditional Labour voters who Corbyn needs in order to win a general election will return to UKIP. And at the same time, mm -hmm. if Theresa May supports a second referendum, traditional Tory voters who, prior to the 2017 general election, departed to UKIP, but then returned at the, night, at the 2017 general election, will go back to UKIP. So it will be electoral suicide for Theresa May. So I just say this, and I'm not taking the side of Theresa May. I'm being impartial mm -hmm. and I'm being logical. She has put forward a plan, but no one else is saying, what they want. It's very easy to criticize when you're not in the driver's seat. That's true. And uh, I'd like to take just a little time out and ask you, uh, if I may, Paolo Rafone, about the EU itself. Uh, we had a um, report uh, of how the leaders of France and Germany, they signed a treaty. This was in a bid to uh, counter crises in the European Union, including growing Eurosceptic nationalism, as they have called it. And uh, give us your reaction to that when France itself is experiencing a revolt within the country from the Yellow Vest protests, and you have Germany that uh, as, uh, it's been a powerhouse, but uh, you know if it doesn't uh, turn out the numbers, it may enter into a recession. Is it that big a deal for the 
UK to fight to stay in the EU? In other words, does the EU have a good report card when it comes to economic performance? <laughs> Uh, you, you have touched uh, a very sensitive issue in Brussels. In fact, France, as you described it, is uh, a country in revolt. The elites uh, uh, governing the country try not to recognize the fact that the majority of people are against the style and politics that the government is still insisting to put into place. Uh, last Saturday, during the uh, Yellow Vest uh, protests uh, out of Paris, in many, many parts of France, you could see some images from, with people out of their balconies with uh, 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 clear signs of support to the protesters. So th this is a clear, clear issue. I mean, the Macron policy, uh, despite the mainstream media saying that he's regaining some kind of uh, credibility uh, among the public, it is a disastrous policy, and no, no, nobody in France is supporting him. The large majority of French are against. Let's go to to, to Germany. Germany is uh, is also in a very difficult situation for the economic side, as you mentioned, but also for the political side because the the Christian Democratic uh, uh, Union. Uh, is not performing at all well uh, all over the country. The Social Democrats are sinking. Uh, the Greens are raising, but they will not be able to form a government on their own. So the, the, the issue is that uh, uh, even in Germany, you have uh, a turmoil at social level, which is a reaction of uh, 10 or 15 years of uh, neoliberal uh, 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 recipes that have been imposed on the population. So people are tired, they want to go back to some kind of dignity and uh, um, uh, not to be buffered around by these politicians. Uh, the reason why Germany and France came together into this treaty today is, um, is because it's their last hope to uh, resist the wave of protest that is uh, uh, raging all over Europe. Uh, personally, I do not think that Europe as it is can resist. Um, uh, the, 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 the setup, the layout and the setup of Europe as we have seen it uh, probably has to change dramatically. If it doesn't, it doesn't do it in a, in a rational way, it will happen in a disorderly way. Um, so from a British point of view, of course, all of this is not an incentive to join a crumbling house. Uh, this is quite clear. Uh, I, I do not believe that uh, it is even in the interest of the UK to do much more Europe for UK once Europe is falling apart. Marcus Papadopoulos, do you agree? Well, I think there's um, a peculiar situation in Britain whereby the leaders of the Brexit camp and indeed a lot of ordinary Britons who voted to leave are under this impression that once Britain leaves the European Union and one way or another the UK is going to leave, that there will be a golden dawn for Britain. Britain will secure golden treaties with countries around the world and Britain and the ordinary British man and woman is going to prosper. Well, I think that is preposterous nonsense. It's absolutely ludicrous. Why? Because Britain and the European Union are in political and economic terms the same. They both embrace neoliberal economics, they, which involves mass privatization. Now, we know that people in Britain are suffering ter terribly as a result of privatization when it comes to train fares, when it comes to paying for their electricity and gas, and gas especially in wintertime. Now, that's not going to change when Britain leaves the European Union. Britain is not going to experience a revolution, no. The political and economic system in Britain is going to remain in track, in intact. Indeed, it's going to remain entrenched in power. So the cost of living is not going to come down 
for ordinary Britons. It's just going to continue to rise and rise. Poverty, um, uh, 14 million Britons living in poverty, 4 million children living on the breadline. That's not going to be reduced. This is not down to the Europe. These problems that Britain is engulfed by, is plagued by, it's not down to the European Union per se. It's down to neoliberal economics, which the European Union embrace and which Britain embraces as well. And I really think that ordinary uh, people in Britain need need to be told that they must not uh, put themselves under this illusion that there's going to be a brighter future ahead. And one other point as well, I was talking to um, an Australian official recently and he told me that Australia is not prepared to enter into a new trade deal with Britain. Why? Because Australia feels uncomfortable about Britain in a post-Brexit world. Because Britain in a post-Brexit world is going to be a major competitor to Australia in Southeast Asia. So the Australians are actually viewing the UK in the post-Brexit world as a competitor as opposed to this new um, golden trading partner that the British government is saying Australia is going to be. Very well. We're going to unfortunately have to end it there. We're fresh out of time. Let me thank our guests, Paulo Rafone, Secretary General of the Sipi Foundation, and Marcus Papadopoulos. Thank you, publisher and editor at Politics First. Also at the top of the debate, we had our Correspondent Russian Mamasala talked to us from London. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of the debate. Questions or comments, newsmarkpressv.ir. From Mikhail Tafi and entire team is goodbye. Until next time.